all for coming. I am Chris Becker. I'm one of the organizers of the Center for Understanding Value and Leadership Program. Um, come to the stage for a conversation about morality, politics, and society. And so what we do is we try to shine a spotlight on some of the work going on on campus that has a kind of philosophical set of challenges related to it. This year we've been talking about inequality. So there are a lot of different kinds of inequality. There's obviously lots of different ways of thinking toward inequality. And uh, but one of the traditions we try to take is to say uh, economic inequality is a complex and unique set of values and experiences. And so we really thrilled then when uh, we got the opportunity to then partner with the Department of Sociology and uh, our other suppliers, uh, the Canadian Culture Trust, to be able to welcome Erica Lee Knight to speak and to talk to us about this work. Um, so let me just give a quick introduction and then some questions for Erica. Um, so he's a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he's well known as a cultural funder and an amicus person uh, for his numerous books and articles on class and inequality, Marxism, democracy, and the idea of being social. Uh, in his work, uh, part of what I love about his work is that he's taken up the difficult but really crucial task of imagining and articulating an alternative to current political and economic institutions. And it's precisely this sort of work that allows the rest of us who take part in the program and other centers to reflect on where we are as a society, where we'd like to be going, and what changes are needed to make that happen. Um, in recognition of his significance to the field of sociology in 2012, Erica Wright was elected president of the American Sociological Association. And I should mention that tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. she'll be giving the Hoover Lecture, uh, sponsored by the Department of Sociology and the Institute of Population and Social Studies. Now his talk tomorrow is entitled Understand Your Class, uh, but what he's going to do uh, today for us is he's going to talk about a new book project entitled How to Be a Good Catholic in 2012. So let's all please uh, welcome uh, Eric Lee. <laughs> So if I hobble around a little bit, I was, um, I was hit by a car riding a bike last November. And I am just recently have abandoned the boot, which I had been wearing for a month and a half. And I'm experimenting with the orthopedist's promise that I could not overdo it, that I might get a little sorer, but that this would not impede the uh, feeble repair work that my aging body seems to be doing with my leg. So <laughs> it is indeed sore than it was yesterday, but I think I can still stand for, uh, for this uh, talk. How to be an anti-capitalist for the 21st century. Well, the very title for some people will seem like an absurdity. It's fine to complain about some of the problems that we see in contemporary American society, the inequalities, the particular forms of deprivation and marginalization th that occurs. But surely our aspiration should be at most to make for a more benign and constructive form of capitalism rather than to be anti-capitalist. To be anti-capitalist implies a particular diagnosis of the nature of the problem. It's not to say that we can't make things better within capitalism. Sure, we can, and we have. There have been times in the history of capitalism where some of the harms generated by capitalism have been significantly mitigated by public policy and by community efforts. Rather, it's to say that we have a particular diagnosis of where the problems are generated, that they're generated by the basic structure of this kind of economy, and that that should be the target of our efforts at social change. Whether or not we can overcome capitalism and replace it entirely with something else, that's an important but additional question. But it defines what the object of our transformative efforts should be. Now, that is a contentious claim. The claim comes basically from the following proposition, that we live in a world in which capitalism generates enormous harms, and yet most people, to most people, it seems like the only way of organizing a complex economic system. I think that's the dominant view, not just in the United States. It's pretty much the dominant view in most places. That uh, for better or worse, capitalism is the only possible way of organizing a complex economic system. Margaret Thatcher famously 
in the early 80s made this a slogan, Tina, there is no alternative. That's the early 80s. 20 years later, in the founding of the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil, the activists who gathered there made an alternative slogan, Another World is Possible. I'm in the Another World is Possible camp. And what I want to discuss today is a particular way of thinking about the strategic problem of how to transform a system like capitalism if you agree with the claim that capitalism is the generative source of the problems with which, of many of the problems with which we have to contend. Now, I'm not going to defend that claim. So the talk I'm going to give is one that most comfortably gets given to a group of committed activists and leftists who already are convinced that capitalism is a crucial problem and they're despairing at the possibility of doing anything fundamental about it. I have other talks I give for people who think capitalism is fine and they need to be convinced that this is a source of problems. I'm not going to defend that claim. I'm happy to do so, but the talk I'm going to present here is on the problem of strategy. How do we go about it? What should be our strategic orientation to the problem of challenging and possibly transcending capitalism? This fits into a broader agenda, <coughs> which I'll just briefly, I won't go through all of the elements. It's a broader agenda of what I call an emancipatory social science, which basically faces four tasks. First, the need to elaborate normative foundations, or perhaps better uh, described as normative principles. Uh, second, the diagnosis and critique of the world as it is, of capitalism in this case, in light of those principles. So you have to have some grounding in which you're going to criticize an existing structure. The normative principles give you that grounding. Third, uh, the elaboration of alternatives. My book, Envisioning Real Utopias, is primarily focused on the problem of alternatives. <coughs> and finally, transformation, how to get from here to there. And this then is the critical question. Is it even possible to have a viable strategy for transforming the fundamental structure of capitalism as an economic system? Now, not everything that we want to transform in the world not the case for everything that we might want to transform, that there is a possible strategy. A strategy means that we can think through a set of practices, activities, individually and collectively, in which we could engage now, in the present, which contribute to bringing forth the goal in the future. To say it's a strategy rather than just an activity implies that you're engaged in these processes in a world where there are other people, groups, centers of power also engaged in strategy. Strategy always implies that you live in a world of intentional actors where you know that other people have act, are intentional actors. That's what strategy means, as opposed to just behavior or action. Well, not everything we want to change is accessible to strategy. Indeed, there is a tradition in sociology, I think um, in recent times most clearly announced by Theta Scotchpole, who said revolutions aren't made, they happen. Well, that's a nice slogan. I remember it after having read it 40 years ago, so I haven't forgotten it yet. Revolutions are made. Uh, revolutions happen, they're not made. What that suggests is that before revol revolutionary moments occur, there is no strategy. It's an illusion. Lenin didn't really have a strategy, just that the Russian Empire collapsed because of World War I. And Lenin's strategy wasn't, how can I foment World War I in order to create a collapse of the Russian army? No, I mean, that's not how it happened. It's just that World War I took the peculiarly destructive and prolonged form it did which was not the result of the strategies of any revolutionaries, that it led to the collapse of a repressive regime that created the possibility for a seizure of power. And it really wasn't the case that somehow in the wings, Lenin and his comrades had 
organized a revolutionary party capable of organizing a civil war to defeat the forces that would be unleashed by that collapse. It turned out that that occurred, but it was mostly jerry-rigged after the fact as, it, as those historical events took place. Now, there, of course, there was ideological preparation. There was all sorts of organizational networks that existed without which perhaps even with the collapse of the, so of the Russian Empire and the Russian military regime of revolution wouldn't have occurred, maybe. The counterfactual history is always super complicated. But maybe that's the world we're living in now, that uh, however much one might object to capitalism and see it as a central causal process that generates tremendous harms in the world, <coughs> that we just can't have a strategy to do anything about it. Well, I'm arguing to the contrary, that we can think strategically about this problem. We can engage in various kinds of practices which not just increase the likelihood of being over able at some point in an unspecified future to go beyond capitalism, but which actually enable us in some sense to go beyond capitalism inside of capitalism itself. And I want to lay out the reasoning and the character of this kind of proposal. Okay, well, here's how I'm going to go about it. I'm a sociologist and as any of you who are sociologists know the favorite theoretical tool of sociologists is the two-by-two two table. Um, Rachel Dwyer is a student of mine, and she's chuckling there in the corner because she knows my fondness for two-by-two two tables. Uh, I often say if a student comes to me with a list of three of something, that there's something missing, <laughs> that if there's three, there's probably a missing fourth. Uh, and it's actually, uh, it's actually an interesting exercise to, uh, give some, to give students a list of three for which you know what the fourth is and say, give me a two-by-two two table that organize these three and then tell me what the missing fourth is. Uh, in fact, the story, I'm, the account of strategic logics of anti-capitalism that I'm going to present grew out of an initial list of just three. That is, I mean, this is actually part of the biography of this argument that initially I said that there were two classical strategies of opposing capitalism. We can call these smashing capitalism and taming capitalism. And I proposed a third, eroding capitalism. I had three, but what was the fourth? And as I thought about it, I eventually got a fourth, and then I displaced eroding and changed the way it looked, and now you're going to get the end process of this practice of concept formation. But at its heart, methodologically, is the two-by-two two table. OK, the strategic logic of anti-capitalism. We have two dimensions. What is the goal of the strategy? And what is the primary locus of strategy? The goal of the strategy has two basic types. There is uh, transcending the s existing structures, going beyond them, or neutralizing harms. So you can have a strategy that's attempting to simply counteract the harms of capitalism, but doesn't have as part of its strategic vision <coughs> going beyond capitalism. And you can have a strategy that sees the task as transcending structures. And second, the primary locus of the strategy can be the state or civil society. Civil society understood in a very expansive sense as the target of um, strategic action. OK, let me quickly run through the four cells of this table. First, smashing capitalism. Smashing capitalism. Now, when I've presented this in various places, uh, some people wince at the expression smashing capitalism and, and argue with some reason that it's actually not quite an accurate description of even the revolutionary ruptural vision. It's meant to capture, however, this idea that, that the way to go beyond capitalism is to destroy it by seizing power transforming the state itself to be an effective instrument for dismantling the centers of capitalist power. 
So it's the, the classical revolutionary slogan is actually smash the state, not smash capitalism. Uh, and of course, the classical Leninist Marxist vision about what happens is that you have a revolutionary seizure of power. You transform that state from one kind of state to another. That state is then used to dismantle the centers of power of capitalism, which sets in motion a long-term, slow, not abrupt transition to an alternative. So there is a notion of a long transition, but that's set in motion by a rupture. And I'm capturing that with the perhaps excessively polemical term smashing capitalism. Uh, some of my intellectual interlocutor, the people I talk to about this, want me to just say dismantling capitalism. But that doesn't seem how it captures the passion that that cell typically represents in its strategic embodiment. Well, smashing capitalism was, so I'm going to use that term, okay? But you understand the theoretical idea behind it. Uh, that was a quite credible view about how we could go beyond capitalism. And it animated struggles from some time in the latter, middle to latter part of the 19th century, well into the middle decades of the 20th century. Uh, the problem with smashing capitalism, uh, as I see it, is not at its foundation a kind of moral issue. If capitalism could be smashed through a ruptural transformation, and if it could result in an emancipatory alternative, even though that's a costly way of imagining how a transformation would occur, well, then I would have to say, well, that's a good contender for a strategic approach. Uh, the problem, I think, is twofold with the idea of smashing capitalism in the 21st century, certainly for developed, uh, complex capitalist societies. First of all, it's very hard to imagine a circumstance in which the social forces mobilized opposed to capitalism would have sufficient power, not merely to oppose capitalism, but to actually institute a rupture. That is to seize the power of the state in such a manner that they could launch a ruptural transition. So it's hard to imagine the social forces being gathered with sufficient coherence to do that. But even if they did have that capacity to launch a transformation in that manner, I think it's very implausible that it would result in the outcome desired by an as an emancipatory alternative. And certainly we have no evidence that attempts at ruptural breaks with complex systems, such as a capitalist economy, that a ruptural break uh, would be able to construct a democratic, egalitarian, solidaristic alternative. The historical experience of attempts at ruptural breaks has always been to unleash sufficiently destructive forms of violence that to restore social order required a highly repressive structure of political rule that violated democratic norms and violated in a way that there was, it was very difficult, probably impossible to escape. That is, it wasn't that the authoritarian and repressive restoration of social order was merely a prelude to a democratization of society. It was a lock-in to an alternative form of politics, and thus an alternative form of economy. Uh, so the result of revolutionary attempts at revolutionary ruptures were indeed a destruction of, an old, of the old order. We know that's possible, but not the construction of the new order that was desired. You know, the, um, the IWW anthem uh, Solidarity Forever has this line, <coughs> we will build a new world from the ashes of the old. We will build a new world from the ashes of the old. That's the smashing capitalism imagery. The problem is we know how to burn down the old world. That's been done a bunch of times. But the building of a new world from the ashes turns out to be probably an impossible task. Perhaps not. I, that is, I can't give you an impossibility theorem that says there are no circumstances under which a smash first, build second strategy couldn't result in an emancipatory alternative, by which I mean a democratic, a profoundly democratic, egalitarian, and solidaristic alternative. I can't prove that that's 
literally impossible, but I think it's implausible and that the evidence from the 20th century is largely on the side of showing that that's implausible. Okay, that's a crucial starting point. If we can't smash the system, if a ruptural break is really not possible, we can't achieve the goals we want, what are the alternatives? Okay, well there's three other kinds of strategies which give us our menu from which we can then think through this problem. First, there is what can be called taming capitalism. This is the classic social democratic strategy. Uh, social democratic strategies for dealing with the harms of capitalism were to create new institutions that were not themselves capitalist, that is they did not involve private ownership and allocation of resources in order to maximize profits. Rather, they were political alternatives, political institutions, mechanisms that attempted to neutralize some of the worst harms of capitalism, to neutralize a, a wide array of negative externalities of profit maximizing strategies, and to neutralize the deep risks that people faced in life by virtue of living in a market economy dominated by capitalism. Um, social insurance in its various forms was the classic innovation of social democratic political institutions. And it did a pretty good job of taming capitalism. Many of the harms were mitigated. And there's no doubt about it that living <coughs> in Northern Europe in the uh, golden years, as it's called, and even living there today in the period where some of these institutions are a bit ragged, but still in important ways intact, uh, made life much better than under the forms of capitalism that lacked such neutralizing mechanisms. Uh, so taming capitalism, I think, has been a viable strategy for doing, for expressing the anti-capitalist idea that capitalism is the source of harms. We have to do something to neutralize those harms. Uh, it has been a vibrant and important thing. Whether or not it is a viable strategy for the 21st century is somewhat in doubt. Uh, the forces of globalization and financialization of capital that have occurred over the last four decades or so have unleashed a set of forces that have undermined the capacities of states to do as good a job at taming capitalism as they did in the past, and has undermined the forms of social solidarity that were needed politically in order to sustain a strategy of taming capitalism. It's not so much that states are actually all that incapacitated to actually do something to neutralize the harms of capitalism, but the solidarity conditions under which they have the political will to do so, I think, has eroded. Um, I mean, after all, most of the redistribution in a place like Denmark or Sweden uh, to provide for the, these insurance structures and these public goods most of that redistribution occurred among wage earners. It was not primarily a redistribution from capital to labor. It was mostly a redistribution among people who earned their earnings in the market. That was where most of the redistribution came, and that reflected solidarity. That reflected a willingness of people to say, yes, I'll forego some of my private income for a social wage, which would be shared by all. Well, that, I think, just reflects the fact that taming capitalism depends upon fairly robust collective solidarity, a sense of community. Uh, we're all in this together. And when that's eroded, then even if the institutions of taming capitalism have continued, albeit in a more ragged form in Sweden and elsewhere, uh, the prospects for the future are less bright. If you're interested in a really gloomy view of these possibilities, I recommend Wolfgang Streck's new book, uh, how Will Capitalism End, where he is really gloomy about this. Uh, speaking from the heart of Europe, he feels that the democratic foundations for a, the social democratic project have eroded nearly to the point of collapse. Uh, well, that's taming capitalism. I'm more optimistic than Streck is, but I think there's a problem. Okay, the third strategic possibility. This is probably the oldest, the most pervasive. It's simply resisting capitalism. You try to neutralize harms by blocking the moves of capitalists when they try to re 
uh, intensify exploitation. They try to remove benefits. You resist. They try to put a toxic waste dump near where you live. You resist. You mobilize to resist. That's been the heart of the labor movement, right? The heart of the labor movement is not to transcend capitalism. It's to mitigate harm. So it does also involve some neutralization of harms, but it's really resisting the forms of domination and exploitation that occur in capitalism. Uh, the fourth strategic logic can be called escaping capitalism. Uh, escaping capitalism also began with the birth of capitalism. It's something that people have always tried to do. Think about American history and the movement of farmers west to the Great Plains, particularly after, I mean, the kind of classic story is after the Civil War with the Homestead Act. But this is true before as well. What were they doing? What was that all about? It wasn't to set up agribusiness. I mean, the farmers who went west to have a small homestead wanted to be subsistence producers who would primarily be producing for themselves. That was the heart of what they did. Outside of the market economy, mostly, they were producing not for commodities for the market. They were producing for their own livelihood. And they would sell whatever surplus they had in various ways. They were trying to escape the pressures and uncertainties that came from living in a capitalist market economy for what seemed like a more controllable existence if you owned your own land and produced your own food. You know, after all, the one sector of activity which if you're successful in, you can reproduce yourself without the market is if you're producing food. You know, if you're producing shoes, you can't exist without the market because somebody has to buy them and you have to buy your food. If you're producing food, a small farmer really has the possibility of existing not necessarily entirely outside the market because they were things they wished to purchase, but they weren't dependent on the market. And that's a form of escaping capitalism. Uh, worker cooperatives are another form of escaping capitalism. A worker cooperative is a form of uh, economic organization in which <coughs> the distinction between workers and owners dissolves as workers own their own means of production and democratically organize the production process. It's a it's market economy, but it's a non-capitalist form of a market economy because the units of production are not organized by owners of capital trying to maximize returns on investment. The units of production are workers, uh, worker cooperatives that collectively own their means of production and are interested in the reproduction of their means of production, not maximizing profit. Now, existing in a capitalist economy as a cooperative enterprise puts pressures on worker cooperatives, but not pressures to maximize profits. They do have pressures to make profits, but they need to make only sufficient profits to be able to reproduce their means of production. They don't need, there's no pressure to maximize profits in the way that there is for capitalist firms where capital is invested by external investors who move their investments around in order to get the highest rate of return they, they can. Uh, worker cooperatives are an example then of escaping capitalism, subsistence farmers, hippie communes are an example of escaping capitalism. Um, Certain kinds of intentional communities, uh, indeed um, some very successful intentional communities, probably in the American context, if you think about the Amish. The Amish uh, constitutes uh, an intentional community grounded in a particular set of religious commitments, which has been successful in reproducing itself for uh, you know, hundreds of years at this point, uh, with a um, form of economic organization which interfaces, to be sure, with the capitalist economy, with the market economy, but which has as its core principles of autonomy and social reproduction freed from the risk of the market. It turns out there's a really interesting ethnographic and historical work on the Amish in which the decisions about which modern technologies to shun and which to adopt 
in part comes from the question, which makes us vulnerable? So being off the grid is not just an anti-technology issue. It's a vulnerability issue. And that's the self-understanding. I mean, this isn't an outside analyst saying, aha, look, they've made these choices. Uh, no, it's a vulnerability issue. Well, that's an example. That's escaping capitalism. Uh, escaping capitalism is a, appealing, of course, to many people. Uh, one, it's a kind of um, current that periodically gets more play. I think in the uh, period of the Occupy movement and some of the ramifications of Occupy around the world, this idea that maybe we can build enclaves and escape the depredations of capitalism has gained more traction. It's very hard to imagine escaping capitalism as, in and of itself, a strategy of systemic transformation. And indeed, it's part of its logic is that it occurs in the micro spaces where escape is possible, rather than it takes as its object of strategy directly the macro level, that is, through the state. Well, those are the four types. Now, in actual historical movements that have been reactions to capitalism attempting to deal with its harms, these different strategic logics get combined in various ways. <coughs> in the 20th century, the communist movement, I think, should be thought of as a strategy that combined resisting capitalism with smashing capitalism. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the communist movement was so deeply embedded in labor movements around the world. They combined resisting in the present, in the current context, with the idea that you could build up the necessary solidarities through resistance to challenge the system at the macro level. It's a particular way of understanding how you struggle in the micro settings in which people live, the workplace especially. Um, and how you struggle there in the American context, uh, the communist influence in the CIO was very important with respect to anti-racism, for example, in the 30s and 40s. So it's a particular vision about how you struggle, and the core of how you struggle is you struggle in ways that build solidarity. And the reasons for that were not just because that helps you win whatever battles you're fighting at that moment, but that was part of this longer-term vision, aha, that's the strategy we need so that when the situation is ripe, we can seize the time by having a, a political strategy that would operate at the macro level. Social democracy and the labor movement uh, combine taming capitalism with resisting capitalism. They shared with the communist movement this view that, yes, solidarity is built at the point of production and the lives of people as workers engaged in the capitalist economy. That's the site where you build the solidarities. You have to cement them there. But the you cash those solidarities out by trying to tame capitalism through a reformist agenda. Uh, you can blunt the predatory character of capitalism by having enough solidarity to change the rules of the game under which capitalism functions. And those social democratic rules, in fact, were enormously successful, uh, particularly in Northern Europe, as I said before. Social movements, particularly, I think, some interesting developments in social movements in the last decades. Social movements often combined resisting and escaping. Uh, you, in, in Latin America, the emergence of social movements that are concerned with building what they call the solidarity economy or the social economy. The, the terms social and solidarity economy don't have stable meanings. If you're, uh, if you're in Quebec, they say social economy for the same things that in other places are called the solidarity economy. So just think of it as a couplet, the social and solidarity economy. Uh, the, um, the peasant landless movement in Brazil uh, is a, the MST is a, uh, is a fantastic example of a social movement that sees as its project resisting capitalism, but doing so in ways that, all, that builds non-capitalist enclaves in the countryside. Uh, with all sorts of collective and communal forms of ownership and property and institution building. Uh, and small, you know, less grandiose versions of that combination of resisting and escaping occur <coughs> elsewhere. Uh, the hallmark of the social movement version of this 
is that they try to avoid confrontation with the state. Now, it's true in Brazil, during the, particularly the first part of the rule of the uh, Workers' Party under Lula, really for the first time there was an effort of uh, activists in the landless workers' movement to try to hook up with the state and to have the beginnings of a state project that would help consolidate and expand the reach of the landless workers' movements and its capacity to build alternatives. But that was a kind of add-on. Uh, but an add-on that I think is important. And proposals for that kind of linkage, you know, whether it's a hookup in the modern express use of that expression, you know, a fleeting encounter that's exciting but doesn't last, or a reconfiguration of strategy. To have the social movement strategy of building things from below get combined with a state-centered strategy of securing victories from above, whether that is actually a new strategic configuration, I don't think is so clear. But it's what I call eroding capitalism. Whoops. It's what I call eroding capitalism. So eroding capitalism is a kind of complex configuration of, in a sense, it's kind of learning from the history of social democracy and the labor movement, the history from uh, social movements and their attempts to forge alternatives on the margins and spaces within capitalism. It's an attempt to combine those two. It's, if you will, it's an effort at forging an unlikely and implausible political alliance between social democrats and anarchists. The, the anarchist impulse has been that of like social movements, to build alternatives from below, to resist capitalism and build alternatives, but to sidestep the state. The social democratic alternative is to build alternatives from above by creating these policies which will create new capitalist rules of the game, but not to engage. Social democrats have not been big on things like cooperatives and uh, land seizures, which has, of course, not. Uh, the idea here is to really think through the possibility of forging the logic of taming capitalism with the logic of escaping capitalism linked together through resisting. So that's the kind of triplet of this, of escaping capitalism. Just to, uh, this is a very little digression. When I said at the beginning, I began with, this is a methodological digression. When I began with smashing capitalism, taming capitalism, and eroding capitalism, <coughs> I was arguing for eroding capitalism in my book, Envisioning Real Utopias. And I was trying to bring it into strategic alignment with these other things. So I started with three. And so initially, when I got to my little fourfold table, I stuck eroding capitalism in the cell that was escaping capitalism. But it didn't work. It didn't really make sense because eroding capitalism is not just a micro strategy. It's not just working from below in the trenches, in the spaces. It's specifically about how do you combine that kind of grassroots, bottom-up action with changes of the rules of the game of capitalism from above. And that's when I thought, aha, that means that there's something else going on here. And so I rejiggered it and ended up with the five category model, which is really four plus a set of combinations. OK. Well, that's the model. That's the general idea of, of uh, a strategic logic for the 21st century. It involves uh, programmatically things like uh, advocating for unconditional basic income. So how should we think about unconditional basic income? Unconditional basic income is the idea that all people within some specified jurisdiction, uh, it can be restrictive all citizens within a nation, it can be less restricted all legal residents within a nation, it can be even less restricted all people who are integrated into the economy, whether they're legal citizens or not, in a nation. It can be even less restrictive. We can think about a global unconditional basic income. All of these ideas are in play in the discussions about basic income. What it says is, let's take it in the more restricted sense because it's a little more tractable. So let's say all legal residents in a political jurisdiction, the United States, everybody gets every month a flow of income sufficient to live above the poverty line, unconditionally. You get it whether you're virtuous, 
or not. You get it whether you're rich or poor. Everybody gets it. You can calibrate in, this, in different ways. Children may have a smaller basic income than their parents. The parents would be the custodians of the children's basic income. There's all sorts of details to be worked out. The basic idea is that everybody is just guaranteed in a rich society that they don't live below whatever is defined as a culturally acceptable minimum dignified level of living. Uh, my general view is that the higher the better, that there's no, there's no disadvantage to having as high a basic income as is economically sustainable. All right, so there's lots of things to talk about it. It's a super interesting problem. Think through the moral foundations and the practical feasibility of basic income. You know, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to ponder. But here's how it fits into this strategic logic, right? So if we had a basic income, let's suppose it is sustainable. That's the first question. To be sustainable, it means that if everybody has a basic income, there'll still be enough people who are going to want to go to work to generate earnings to generate the taxes needed to pay for the basic income. So if our deepest aspirations are to be couch potatoes and watch television all day, you know, reruns of, of uh, television shows, or these days with the fantastic array of bingeable series. I mean, you could literally, I suppose, spend all your time watching television without ever having to repeat a show. Uh, if that's really <coughs> our heart's desire, well, then a basic income is impossible, right? It just collapses. The moment everybody has a basic income, nobody works, the system collapses. Let's suppose that's not the case, that our Consumerist culture gives us enough of a desire for a discretionary income that a substantial proportion of the population will still want to work. But note, work is suddenly a choice. You're free to say, no, I don't want to work. What basic income gives everybody is a grant of real freedom. That is the ability to say no. Pretty amazing. Rich children can say no. They can decide to work as an unpaid intern. They don't have to seek a flow of income. Uh, most people aren't in that position. This, in a sense, creates an equality of freedom in the society. I think if you frame it that way, even libertarians begin to think, well, maybe there's something to basic income as a universal freedom grant rather than a consumption grant. OK, so you got an unconditional basic income. Well, what does it do? Why does it fit into this idea of eroding capitalism? What an unconditional basic income does is give people the capacity to engage in building non-capitalist forms of economic belief. Uh, think about worker cooperatives. One of the big problems that worker cooperatives face is uh, what could be described as failures of credit markets. So you know you're a, you have a bunch of people who have a fantastic idea for a, uh, a collective enterprise that they can run. They have a good business plan. They go to the bank to try to get a loan. And the bank looks at the business plan and says, this looks really interesting. But you guys have to generate enough income to eat. And there's no way you're going to be able to pay back our loan, pay the interest, pay back the principal, and eat at the same time. Sorry, we won't give you the loan. Now imagine the same business plan going to a bank. So this is not, we're assuming that banks are not ideologically opposed to it worker cooperatives, they just see it as high risk. Well, now the same business plan suddenly looks viable. Because now the, the firm, the bank only has to ask the question, is this project going to generate enough income to cover the interest cost and pay back the principal? Now, lots of business plans will satisfy that condition if the bank knows that the basic standard of living of the participants is provided independently of the success, the market success of the firm. Well, one way then of thinking about this is that an unconditional basic income is a massive transfer of surplus of the economy from capital accumulation to cooperative accumulation. It makes possible the flourishing and development of cooperative firms where otherwise the credit market simply would be a failure for them. Um, or another domain of life, consider uh, small farmers. <coughs> uh, Farming in every developed capitalist country is subsidized by various kind of agricultural subsidies that are always defended on the grounds that they provide supports for family farms. 
But in fact, as we know, agricultural subsidies overwhelmingly go to agribusiness. They subsidize big farms and corporate farms. They do provide some subsidy for small farms. It is the case, if agricultural subsidies were completely cut off today, bang, no more, small farmers would, would go under. Lots of small farmers survive by the skin of their teeth by virtue of the pitiful subsidies they get, but it still makes the difference of mar the margin between survival or not. So let's imagine the following. Get rid of all agricultural subsidies, but give farmers, like everybody else, a basic income. Suddenly, small farms become much more viable. They don't have to look for a crappy part-time job in the city to supplement the earnings on the small farm. They all, every farm family member has a basic income. So it expands the space for small-scale family farming, not to mention, in addition, possible cooperative farming. But furthermore, it actually makes agribusiness more expensive because farm workers get a basic income too, including uh, undocumented, in my version of a basic income. Everybody who's integrated into an econom economy gets a basic income. Tourists don't. So it's not the case that if you're on a tourist visa and you're visiting the Grand Canyon, you get a basic income while you're in the United States. But if you're working in the economy, you get a basic income. So agricultural labor becomes more expensive. Why are you going to do the backbreaking labor? You have to be bribed to do it. Wages then begin to reflect the disutility of labor. Ah, that's a good thing, rather than labor wages reflecting the vulnerability of labor. So all of these nice things happen. My daughter is a theater director. She's a big fan, as you might imagine, as are most artists and uh, performing artists and poets of basic income. Suddenly, you don't have starving artists. Imagine what this would do to the performing arts. We would be less upset about the abolition of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Arts if every artist had a basic income. Uh, the, it would be a fantastic proliferation of theater which, by the way, has a very low carbon footprint. So <laughs> basic income is an environmental policy as well. OK, uh, basic income, it's uh, all these fantastic things. Uh, finally, a political coalition of peasants and poets. You know, They are on the same side of the fence because they both get a basic income. But from my point of view, the key thing is that if this idea of eroding capitalism has any traction, if it's a remotely plausible, what it means is we have to figure out changes in the rules of the game of the existing system that provide the resources and space for people to get on with the business of building alternative economic circuits and practices. And then the question of whether those can expand to what limit, can they expand to the point where capitalism ceases to be the dominant way that people can gain a livelihood, or whether capitalism would remain dominant but in a smaller space than its current dominance, that I don't have an answer to. That seems to me contingent upon the future and how things would work out. OK, let me uh, quickly run through the rest of, um, well, actually, we, uh, we're supposed to go until, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. We go to 5.30? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in the middle of a sentence if it gets to be 5. All right, so there's still issues to be d resolved. All right, so I've sketched what the logic of the strategy is and how certain content could be put into the strategy, like basic income, and how basic income could help underwrite all sorts of initiatives that would have the character of building a different kind of economic infrastructure in which people could live their lives. OK, there's still many things to be resolved. I haven't said much about what the actual character of the alternative is. There's hints in what I've said, but I haven't laid out the nature of the destination. What actually is the alternative that's implicit in the strategic analysis I've given? Secondly, there is a problem of the theory of the state. This will be a familiar problem to those of you who have you know, some pedigree in the Marxist tradition, but the classical Marxian idea is that the state in, in capitalist society is just not suited for any kind of deep transformation. It is a capitalist state, not just a state that happens to be in a capitalist society, and its very design blocks the possibility of it being used for non-capitalist purposes. So can a capitalist state contribute to eroding capitalism? Can it or can it not? If it can't, that invokes the classical revolutionary idea that the first task is to seize state power and transform the very nature of that machinery. If you don't do that, you're screwed. You, know, you just can't 
sustain any transformative effort. That's the second issue that I haven't yet addressed. And finally, and in some ways the most difficult of all of these issues, who are the collective agents to accomplish all this? I mean, if globalization and financialization and the new technological frontiers of capitalist development have all contributed to this dramatic fragmenting of the working class or of the working population into all sorts of disparate and disjointed segments and fractions and contradictory locations, to use a framework that I've advocated. If this fragmentation has so deeply eroded solidarity, which it has, is there any real prospect for collective agency? Uh, because any of the, if the projects do require changing in the rules of the game under which capitalism functions, and if those changes have to take place at the level of the state, then you have to have a collective actor. You know, the state's not going to just do it willy-nilly because it's, they've read my article or my book. No, of course not. It requires struggle, and you need a collective agent. Is it plausible that the kind of solidarity needed for this task is forgeable in the next decades? I don't mean tomorrow. <laughs> I just mean, is there, a, is there a scenario that we can imagine where uh, the necessary agency can be found? Well, I, um, I'll just quickly run through a sketch of some of the issues, some of which I can't deal with even with longer time. So there, there are advantages sometimes of running out of time. Uh, but first, the destination. About the destination, I've done the most thinking. Uh, I use the term socialism with a, you know, sort of underlining the, the social, a real social socialism. Uh, I use the term socialism to describe the character of the destination. But I see socialism as a radical, heterogeneous economic democracy, rather than socialism being the same as uh, the state organizing and running an entire complex economic system. It's, uh, it, it would require an elaborate exposition to explain the particular meaning of a social socialism that I'm advocating. But here are just some of the issues that are in play. First of all, it means socialism, on, as, I, as I argue for, is a market economy. It's not a, an economy that is comprehensively planned through some uh, authoritative state-centered planning process. Socialism is a form of market economy, but it's a form of market economy in which capitalist firms are at most um, a secondary component. It's not a market economy organized by the imperatives of capital accumulation. It's a market economy that's guided by what uh, I call social accumulation. It implies replacing a market-conforming democracy. That's Angela Merkel's way of talking about the constraints under which we live today, that is a democracy that has to conform to the market with a democracy conforming market. The idea is that we have a market that's subordinated to democracy rather than a democracy that's subordinated to the, mar to the market. Uh, secondly, it means expanding and deepening the cooperative market sector and the social economy. Uh, I'm involved in a project called Pathways to a Cooperative Market Economy, part of my larger Real Utopias project, in which the center of that is to think about the different ways in which cooperative forms of enterprise, uh, particularly worker cooperatives, but not exclusively, can actually be built up within a capitalist economy. And can a cooperative market sector then, a vibrant sector within which the enterprises are themselves cooperative, can a cooperative market sector move from the periphery of a capitalist econ a market economy into the center? Can we have a cooperative market economy that organizes the core of capitalist production? Uh, third, protect the commons and expand the array of publicly provided goods and services. So I think that any prospect, any vision of an alternative that is democratic, egalitarian, and solidaristic has to have a substantial state sector in which the state is directly providing the resources needed to meet human need. Uh, we can call that in a kind of loose way a public goods sector. It doesn't mean that the state itself has to directly run all of those units, 
Uh, I like the, um, the model in Quebec for the public provision of uh, early childhood day, uh, child care centers in which the actual centers are organized uh, through a form that's called a stakeholder cooperative, a solidarity cooperative, I'm sorry, a solidarity cooperative. A solidarity cooperative is different from a worker cooperative. A worker cooperative is owned and run by its workers. In a daycare center, that would mean the daycare workers. A solidarity cooperator, cooperative says all of the stakeholders should govern the, the enterprise, not just the, the providers of labor. So the solidarity cooperatives in Quebec have a board of directors that's chosen by staff, by parents, and by community members who are interested in early childhood education. So you have solidarity cooperatives providing the services uh, the provincial government provides very heavy subsidies to provide living wages for the daycare workers, and parents pay, uh, in 2010, which was the last time I looked at the actual data, they paid $7 a day for full-time daycare. And the um, combination of the $7 a day plus the provincial subsidies meant that the starting salaries for daycare workers in Quebec are in the solidarity sector were about $34,000 a year. The, starting, the average salary, not just the starting salary in the United States, is about 15. You know, so $34,000 a year is not high earning, but it is a stable, um, above poverty level, living wage for sure. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that's a state service. That's provided by the state. You need a strong and integrated and coherent and non-corrupt state in order to have a vibrant sector of things like that. Uh, that's the, the third element. And finally, and perhaps uh, most problematically, and to even think about what we're talking about, we need to democratize the corporations, including the multinational corporations. Now, what could that mean, democratize the multinational corporations? There's a fantastic book coming out by a Belgian sociologist named Isabella Ferreras, being published in uh, Cambridge University Press, coming out in the fall, in which she proposes a model for how you could actually have a democratically organized um, multinational corporation. And if I keep to my promise about stopping in mid-sentence in three minutes, I think I can probably just get through the, the, the short version. Okay, here's Isabel's model. And it's a model, it's a speculative proposal. Uh, although it's been adopted as a party platform by the Belgian Socialist Party. So it's getting some traction already. Okay, here's the idea. If you look at the largest multinational corporations, their internal economy is bigger than most countries. So let's pretend they're countries, that they really are political units. And a good argument can be made that a multinational corporation is a political unit. In the history of parliamentary democracies, let's take Britain as the archetype. Uh, originally, you had a chief executive officer called the king, who in order to govern, to extract resources, had to make a deal with the great magnates of the land and form some kind of council. Uh, in the British case, we now call it what was called for many years the House of Lords, which was a governing body of great magnates where essentially their votes was one acre, one vote. You know, they, uh, they had the the, their power in that body of negotiation with the king depended upon how big and powerful a baron they were. But eventually that proved problematic. Once the investments of the king needed to be investments of labor, people, particularly for fighting wars, rather than just investments of capital, money from the great magnates, and so you get a house of commons. Um, and event, you know, I'm just a super stylized and butchered story account of it, you end up with a bicameral parliamentary system where you have a, a chamber of wealth holders and a chamber of the people. Well, imagine a corporation being organized that way, a bicameral board of directors where you have the labor investors and the capital investors each having their uh, chamber of delegates, which they elect. The, the magnates of the chamber of capital elected on a basis of one share, one vote, the chamber of labor is a one person, one vote. Uh, and the king, the CEO, is accountable to the two chambers. So that all policy and all strategic changes 
have to pass both houses, both chambers. Uh, well, there's much more detail. I've got 15 seconds. The capital estate, we must democratize democracy to expand the limits of socialist relations within capitalism. The capital estate is an internally contradictory machine. It's not a, uni a univocal structure that is a totality. It's internally contradictory, and we, democracy itself is a contradictory element within the capital estate. We need to democratize democracy, and I've got lots to say about that. And agency, well, this is the, where the hand-waving comes. Constructing a democratic egalitarian coalition for multi-layered collective action. How's that for a non-answer to the question, what's the agency for this action? That's the part of the equation which I actually I have the least to say about. I can say the conventional things about coalitions, about identities, about pluralism, all those sorts of things which I think are right, but I don't think they tell us how to do it, how to actually forge the necessary solidarity to challenge the world as it is. Thanks. And I would like a volunteer to take notes for me because I, I like to write up after I have encounters like this, retrospective notes so that I capture the ideas that are. But I need somebody to be my note taker so I don't have to worry about. It. So, some. I'm going to sound check this okay. mic just by asking a question. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, thanks. So thanks. I have a, a quick concern or not? I don't know. Whatever. So so. There's the escaping capitalism option, and I'm wondering why the scenarios that you discussed aren't actually arguments for capitalism, because although we, th we do see a number of different ways of organizing non-capitalistically, they don't scale naturally. Um, so why is that? Well, the escaping capitalism comes from the initiatives of uh, people without power, and um, the things which they can do if they want to escape capitalism are of necessity, things in which there are not big economies of scale. Uh, economies of scale have the quality that it's very costly to do them unless you can do them big. Right? So the thing about subsistence agriculture is that if you can get away with it, if you can find the land and can get access to it, you can do it small. Uh, there's some sectors of worker co-ops you can do small. So things that you can do through bottom-up initiatives without support from above are the things that are not very scalable uh, because they have linear returns to scale. I mean, they can be somewhat scalable. You can get, there's a difference between tiny cooperatives and modest cooperatives. But basically, those are the things that you can do if you're doing it without support from above. In the Pathways to a Cooperative Market Economy project, one of the issues is, well, why should we settle for cooperatives only forming through initiatives from below. Maybe there are ways in which we can change the rules of the game under which cooperatives form, uh, which will enable um, larger entities to cooperativize. And that has happened in some places in the world. In, in, in most famously, the Mondragon Worker Cooperative Conglomerate has very large enterprises. But that's because they have a different set of rules of the game under which cooperatives form and are sustained. I was going to ask you, is, is this loud enough? Okay. I was going to ask you about economies of scale, but you already took care of that, along with bureaucracy, I suppose, in the back. What about demogrants and the governments of demogrants? Wouldn't that, if we could get it passed, wouldn't that start undermining the system as you wish? So that's very similar to uh, unconditional basic income. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there, are a variety of, uh, there are a variety of moments in American history where something close to a basic income was on the table. In, um, in the Nixon administration, uh, a negative income tax was actually proposed. And I think it came within one or two votes of passing. Uh, it was to replace the existing welfare payments of the time, AFDC, with, an un with a negative income tax. Uh, it was opposed by liberal Democrats because it would have represented a cut in welfare. That is, it was set at a lower level than the existing welfare payments. It turns out that uh, it wasn't that long before the existing welfare payments fell below what the negative income tax would have set it at. 
And one could imagine that dynamically, the politics of a negative income tax, just like the politics of the earned income tax credit, which is in the same family, but a little bit different, because you have to earn income to get it. Uh, the politics of, an un of a, of a uh, negative income tax probably would have made it more stable. It probably would have had less of a tendency to erode over time, and, ev and perhaps even could be a context for struggle for its expansion. Yeah, so in Switzerland, there was a vote on an unconditional basic income last year, which lost. Uh, it got uh, close to 40% of the vote. So it didn't, it didn't get 10%. It didn't get 60%. Substantial basis for it. Uh, it's, a, it it's a striking idea. People are skeptical of it for two kinds of reasons. And the, the politics of a basic income has to overcome this skepticism. One is it seems to break with reciprocity ideas. Why should anybody be paid an income if they don't contribute to the society? So the unconditionality just cuts against a set of moral intuitions that most people share. I share. You know, I mean, I find the idea that um, a basic income will go to people who are going to be couch potatoes and watch television irritating, and morally irritating. It makes me feel. Well, lots of people are going to work hard and generate the income. So you can watch television, give me a break, right? So the problem then is this. Well, you could solve that problem by putting a contribution requirement. You get the basic income if you make a social contribution. But then you have to create a machinery to monitor people to see who's making a contribution or not. You have to have panels to decide what counts as a contribution. Uh, you, you generate all this deadweight overhead costs of a surveillance apparatus to see whether you're worthy of a basic income. And of course, scams will develop. There'll be endless ways that people are going to cheat us. So all of that's going to be a dead cost on the project. So then, the, to me, it's an empirical question. If 10% of the people are scumbags and parasites and don't ever contribute to society, well, c'est la vie. That may be the cost we have to pay for the emancipatory potential of, a free, of an equal freedom grant for everyone. If it's 40%, no, it's not going to work. We're going to have to do something about it. I don't see, I think any project that has deep potential will have unintended negative consequences as well. And you can either try to counter them by building it into the project, or you can say sometimes you have to put up with the negative side effects. Depends on the magnitude. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, so, first of all, I just want to say uh, hi real quick from my parents who are professors here, um, Pat and CISO and Brian Edmiston. I don't know if you remember them, but apparently they knew you at UW-Madison. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and apparently I used to go uh, with them to some of the retreats you led. I don't remember because I was oh, a little wow. kid. But so when I, was that, uh, in the 90s then? Or yeah. yeah. yeah that w oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that would have been. But uh, they said I uh, just about in the red diaper club. <laughs> 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 but anyway. Well, say, say hello to your parents. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, they asked me to. Anyway, um, they would have been here, but they were teaching. Any, in any case, my, my question is, um, I wanted to ask, uh, you touched on this very, very briefly, but about the you know, ongoing and accelerating ecological devastation that um, capitalism is you know, wreaking upon the planet, and uh, which is in some ways also contributing to it um, eroding itself, you know, given that the, the uh, material basis for capitalism depends on, you know, um, an unsustainable um, exploitation of resources. Um, and I wonder, uh, A, how that, um, uh, <laughs> well, I guess so, A, whether that sort of puts us on a clock as far as doing something about capitalism before it, you know, um, undermines the basis for life itself on the planet. Um, and, and B, how um, we can integrate a sustainable ecological environmental um, vision into whatever may grow up to, to right. replace it. So are we on a clock? I think my reaction is this. If we are on a clock, then the game is probably lost. You know, so if Naomi Klein is right, it's not actually a call to action. It's a call to partying. You know, if, if it's true that capitalism has to be overcome in the next two decades, it's not going to be overcome. It's not going to happen. There's no possible scenario of mobilization and struggle that's going to bring capitalism to an end and replace it with a democratic, egalitarian, solidaristic, future-oriented alternative. 
in the near future. So if it's right that the actual end of life on Earth is in play with that time horizon, that's not a call to action. That's a call to partying, eat, drink, and be merry. Right. So either because the argument is wrong or because I just refuse to accept it, uh, I don't think we're on a clock. I also don't think that um, it's so obvious that capitalism won't thrive under conditions of ecological damage or even ecological catastrophe. It would not thrive under ecological destruction. You know, if the planet becomes uninhabitable, capitalism doesn't do very well. But there's a lot of money to be made out of seawalls. You know, Manhattan is going to build a seawall. It's going to happen at some point. Uh, the Netherlands has lived 20 feet or so below sea level for a couple of hundred years quite successfully. We know it's possible to build seawalls that protect coastal areas below sea level. The, Net the Dutch have done it. They know how to do it. It's going to be done around big global cities in the north. And there's going to be a lot of money made out of that. Because it's not government construction companies that are going to build it any more than government construction companies build battleships. Why do capitalists like wars sometimes? Not always, but sometimes. Well, there's a lot of money to be made out of war. right? So we'll have an environmental industrial complex, not a military industrial complex, because the scale of government investment needed to mitigate, you know, just, I mean, to adapt to the ecological crisis that's, a com that's coming, just on the climate change dimension, there's plenty of other aspects of environmental, uh, that's going to require mass public investment, just like wars did. But wars don't, in and of themselves, harm capital accumulation. It just creates a form of state capitalism rather than ordinary market capitalism. But wars change the politics of the state, as will environmental crisis. And it is one of the sources for potential solidarity that transcend the fragments and demand a new social compact around social justice and social change. Uh, just as after World War II, that's what partially contributed to the three or four decades of um, more tamed solidaristic development. You know, so I, I think there's possibilities opened up by the environmental crisis. It surely is going to doom neoliberalism. I mean, you can't have a hands-off, small government, no taxes regime if you have to build seawalls around Manhattan and, uh, and other places. So it's, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. My question is about, um, I was never quite clear on how you conceptualize civil society. Because when you think about civil society, or um, so Gramsci talks about the two levels of the superstructure, the state and civil society, which you put as your um, axis, right? You can also think of civil society in sort of like a Habermas communicative sort of public sphere sort of way. You're not talking about it in this way. You're talking about economic activity like uh, worker cooperatives or labor unions. Um, and so I'm curious why you chose civil society instead of businesses, economy, corporations, um, and then how you sort of conceptualize okay. civil society. So, I, so first of all, I, I don't, I'm not treating either the state or civil society as superstructures in the Gramscian sense, I think, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. I'm thinking of civil society as the sphere of uh, voluntary association for collective action. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, is, it is Habermasian in that sense. It has it's a sphere where deliberation and, a, and public occurs. Uh, but it's not outside of the economy. That is the Various kinds of economic activity are part of this sphere of voluntary association and collective action. You know, so you, I originally made the distinction instead of state civil society, macro micro. Because the feeling was that these eroding, these escaping and uh, resisting strategies are occurring in the local face to face on the ground micro settings of people's lives, and the state was of course macro. And that might capture this. But on the other hand, since the strategies at the macro level target the state, that is the focal object. Because that's how you change macro structures, as a direct 
object of struggle. You do it by changing rules that govern macro structures. It seemed to that saying state was just clearer. And then the counterpoint to the state didn't seem like it was micro. That seemed, you know, just not not the right kind of uh, spectrum. And that's why I put it as civil society. So I'm meaning it in this very loose sense. Um, ap actions against corporations, since I think of large corporations as political entities, it's, you know, it's the action is originating in civil society. The target is, is more like a, a state. So it wouldn't fall comfortably into that. Uh, you know, that way, of, that dichotomy. Yeah, so uh, if it's a, uh, if you're protesting a corporation that is dumping toxic wastes, I would call that resisting capitalism because the corporation doesn't create the rules of the game under which toxic wastes are dumped. So you're resisting the depredations of a firm, even if it's a large firm. If, however, your strategy for changing the rules about toxic waste is to make life intolerable for corporations by prosting every damn corporation that occurs, then you're really targeting the state as well. Because you want this struggle against the corporations to play itself out as a change in the rules of the game over toxic waste. You know, and so, I mean, that's how I think about it. So, oh wow, it's loud. <laughs> uh, so I am wondering how we can solve sort of the problem of intellectual property without smashing capitalism. Uh, in part because it seems to me one of the problems of the 21st century is is that we're going to have intellectual property becoming increasingly important through like roboticization, 3D printing. I mean, even right now, like we have a regime where intellectual property is being enforced upon us when we don't necessarily need it. We're creating artificial scarcity, and this is one of the that are fundamental problems of capitalism right. in the 21st century. And it seems to me that if we are destroying an entire category of property, right. uh, that that's going to require actual smashing of capitalism itself. Right. So how do we do this? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> intellectual property is terribly destructive. And the arguments that you need patents, especially long patents, in order to create incentives is just total bullshit. It's just not true. Uh, it's remarkable, if you look at the economics literature on patents, the uh, economists have not been able to demonstrate that the rate of innovation is positively affected by the strength of patents. And the reason for that is that patents have two effects, not one. One is it protects your property rights so you can get monopoly rents out of the patent. That's why it's supposed to generate incentives for innovation. But it slows down the diffusion of ideas and of techniques. And that slows innovation. And whether or not you have a net increase or decrease in innovation depends upon the rate, the, the, those two effects. And it turns out that uh, uh, economists haven't been able to demonstrate. Uh, this, this is on the basis of statements by colleagues of mine who are economists. So I haven't done the research to see if they're telling me the truth, but they, or they're, if they're accurate in their diagnosis. OK, so first of all, the justification for patents is bogus. It really doesn't, there's not good claim. Now, in the current context, there are lots of um, alternatives to patents that are already in place, and most notably in open source kinds of digital communities where various kinds of licensing arrangements around the commons uh, under different, you know, there's different terms for it, different particular licensing agreements. There's copyleft instead of copyright. Uh, there's the Creative Commons license for artistic production. There's a whole variety of things. I'm sure you're aware of those. Now, the question is whether or not a strategy of building up a protected commons of intellectual property rights and getting the innovators, the people who love doing this, the people who inhabit hacker spaces and maker spaces and are engaged in producing open source, whether or not we can gradually shift uh, and expand a commons of intellectual property enough that it is itself corrosive of capitalist property rights. And in some s narrow spaces, that's occurred. Uh, now, the question of how broad that can be, I think it's uncertain. Um, uh, there is um, 
there's definitely a movement for a global digital library under, um, I don't know if it's Creative Commons, I don't know what the licensing form would be, but let's just call it a Commons licensing for designs for digital printers. So that if you expand the design library in which people who work for high tech companies in their spare time because they like doing this and they like, many people like the idea that they're contributing to a global digital library. Uh, then people can download these, um, these essentially blueprints, but they're code for digital printers and print things themselves. Some of these things have been successful. We're in early stages. Uh, there's also a similar movement around pharmaceuticals to create open source pharmaceuticals. Uh, and, and scientists in some places are involved in the open source pharmaceutical movement. Now, whether or not these things can scale up, can become powerful enough to be an, a, another part of this eroding capitalism, I don't know. Uh, we have to struggle against the intellectual property rights as well, though. We have to weaken them, not strengthen them. Have to be sure they're not inscribed in uh, global trade agreements. Uh, I mean, that's the, one of the worst things that the United States has done with respect to global trade is to insist on stronger intellectual property rights than other countries want, uh, which is a, clearly a regressive thing to do. Well, yes, and I just think there's a lot of uncertainty as to how these things develop. Uh, and, and, I mean, just as another example, <coughs> um, the code that's used in the Uber app, which is what it makes it possible for it to be such a powerful and flexible corporation, to create a, uh, a, a key component of urban transportation systems in some cities and not others. Okay, so that code exists. It turns out, that although Uber has patents all over the wazoo on its code, it's not that hard to create an Uber-like taxi app. And there are taxi cooperatives now emer emerging in various cities. Uh, Denver, I think, is the one that's the most developed for this, with this idea, in which they are de have developed a Uber-ish <laughs> taxi app. And the struggle then is in the municipality, which I think they will win, to <coughs> have the municipality advertise the Uber app and make it, you know, the free download so when people arrive at the airport, which is the main place where people get taxis, and they see call Uber, call this, they also see the, the uh, green spirit, I, I, green, I forget what it is, it's green, it has green in the title in Denver. Okay, now this is just emerging. I think it'll win. I, I, there's certainly no reason why it won't win. It has the disadvantage at this point that if you have the Uber app, any city you go to, you can use it. Well, if these cooperative apps begin to develop and they are themselves open source, then in different cities, they'll be using the same cooperative app. And it'll get promoted by social movements who are opposed to Uber. And taxi drivers are going to defect from their corporate taxi companies, which screw them, and not go to the Uber taxi company, which screws them, and form taxi cooperatives with the, tax, the universal taxi cooperative app. Now, I think they can compete with Uber, uh, in spite of Uber's power. I don't see there's any reason, and that's because of this technology, which is once you develop it, it's got scalability, it does, the economies of scale problem. In this case, it's just that you need it on everybody's smartphone, and that'll take time. So this is just to say the subversive potentials of these new technologies given how rapidly they develop and how quickly outmoded any given platform is, and therefore that open space for open source innovation. I don't think we're so locked in. And maybe Facebook will always be there, but that's only one component of this broader ecosystem of information possibility. How many people are on the stack? Um, I don't mind. So I. I have a general principle about we collect a few about the arbitrariness of clocks in the context of interesting discussion. Okay, <laughs> I, I want to go back to the universal basic income and the intuition that um, couch potatoes somehow are violating something there, and um, plumb the intuition a little bit deeper because I wonder whether there's 
still yet a problem of, with capitalism, um, which is I don't think I share that same um, intuition when I think about the clean water that's being pumped to the um, couch potatoes house. I don't think that we should turn it off. Um, and so there's something about that public good that I'm willing to share. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, is there something about money um, and that as an abstract concept that triggers something in us um, that uh, makes that other intuition emerge when we don't think about clean water? So <coughs> Philippe von Paris wrote a brilliant and classic essay, which is the title of which is Why Surfers Should Be Fed. And it's an argument for why beach bums should get a basic income, right? As a, that it really should be a universal right without regret. And I think he's correct in that. That is, the, the position is basically if, a, if the child of a wealthy person can be a beach bum, why shouldn't anybody be able to be a beach bum? That, and if you think of it as a universal freedom grant, and you think freedom is something that we should have as distributed on an egalitarian basis as a human right, the only way to distribute freedom on an equal right is to give people a basic income. Because otherwise, some people are more free than others. So I buy that argument. And that's why, um, that's why I'm unequivocally a supporter. I do think there's another moral issue, though, which I give lower priority to, but which is a principle of burden and contribution, which would apply to the clean water to the beach bum. Other people are sweating and paying for it, and they get free water. I think they should, I mean, clean water, they should get it. But why are they living off of my labor? Why am I making all these you know, sacrifices and doing things I wouldn't, would prefer not to do because I need to earn some extra income? But the extra income I'm generating is also going to them. And they're not giving anything back to the society. I'm not saying they should give it back to me, but they, it somehow sticks in the craw. Of, and I think of most people, the idea of a failure of reciprocity. And I don't think that's just a capitalist norm. Indeed, capitalist doesn't give a shit about real reciprocity. But I think that's pretty much, you know, if it's correct as evolutionary biologists and kind of evolutionary moral theorists believe that we are hardwired because of our soci sociality as creatures. I mean, we're the kind of creature that is hardwired to have some cap moral capacity. Now, whether we're, it still requires socialization and all that, but there is some sort of moral sensibility that seems part of our neurological structure, just like languages. So we have a, I don't mean that there's a little moral bit of our brain and a little language bit. I, I have no idea what the mechanism is. It's a pretty cultural universal, the idea of reciprocity and uh, the notion of a free rider. N nobody defends free riding. Nobody says, oh, it's so great. We should all just be free riders on other people's sacrifices. No. You know, even if people do it, they do it with a, a, quinge of, a, a cringe in their hearts, I hope. So, uh, and we, so that's the sense in which I think an unconditional basic income is going to evoke that moral issue. If you reframe it as equal freedom grants, that dampens it because that does resonate with another value people hold. So now people, this is what happens when I teach this for my undergraduates, now they realize there's two values that they're holding and they, don't, and they work against each other. They really believe everybody should be equally free, but they really think it's, you know, it's terrible for somebody to just um, be lazy and other people to work hard. So they hold the deservingness criteria and they hold an equal freedom and they have to then grapple with the, and that's when I bring up the, um, the deadweight cost issue. And that makes it easier, I mean, that argument, the extreme monitoring cost to prevent the free riding, is what tips some people over to the view, all right, this is just a cost, you, have. you, you know, this is a, a moral downside, but it's worth paying for, it's worth going along with it. Um, I, feel the moral downside, even though I'm unequivocally feeling that the surfer should be fed, <laughs> should get the basic income. And that's a, a real should. You know, It's not just a pragmatic should. It's a real should, because everybody should have equal freedom. But I also feel, oh, 
why doesn't he contribute something to the rest of us? Uh, I know we're short on time, so I'll make it quick. For um, some of the more technically demanding professions, such as engineering or a medical field or, or law, what would be the incentives for them to go into that knowing that uh, it, it just requires an enormous amount of discipline to go into those fields, yet it doesn't seem like there's much incentive at that point? Do you think most people go into those fields because they – Really because of the financial incentives? I mean, I, I sure as hell didn't go into sociology for financial incentives. Uh, and, um, you know, there's an argument that if we didn't, if, if, if what, what people are being guaranteed is a basic income. All right, so it's, I don't know, in the United, if, if we did it on American standards, it would mean something in the twelve to $15,000 for a per an adult person, somewhere around there. Well, first of all, that's peanuts for these high-paid, you know, professionals. Their incomes will go down because they'll be net, net contributors. Their taxes are going to go up. Uh, big deal. I mean, they're living, they're living above the flourishing level of life already. You know, the the, the, mar the declining marginal t utility of income unequivocally shows. Now, all the data on how much gratification and life satisfaction and meaning you get out of income. It, it's, it rises and then it asymptotically flattens out and these people are earning too much. So, and I don't think, I, I just don't think the incentive structure carries much weight. Now it does for some crappy jobs that pay well. Crappy jobs that pay well, of which there are some but not many, um, uh, people aren't gonna wanna do. And crappy jobs that pay badly, ooh, there's gonna be an incentive problem there. But that's good. It's hard. It should be hard to get people to do that kind of work. I just don't get why it's a problem. I mean, I graduate students spend years of poverty, uh, if they had a basic income, they'd finish graduate school quicker. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see how giving everybody a basic income is going to reduce the desirability of a technically demanding field that's exciting and interesting and gives life some meaning. But a, a basic income isn't going to encourage people who have ambitions and creative desires it's not going to encourage them to be lazy. It's going to, I mean, if I think of, again, in my daughter's world as a theater director, um, it's going to change what they do. So she has people in her theater company that, um, you know, they wait tables and they're exhausted and they go for eight hours of rehearsal at night. Right? They work their buns off. If they had a basic income, they wouldn't have to do the table waiting, or they would do it for fewer hours just to get some additional change, and they would have more energy for their artistic work and whatever. I mean, I just, so there will be specific zones where there's going to be an incent incentive issue. Some of those, it'll be a good thing. It'll be a good thing that it's going to be much harder to get people to do really crappy work, right? Which will force either that that work isn't going to get done anymore, you know, or that it'll get automated, or that it'll pay well. And that's as it should be. Thank you.